Hello there everyone and welcome to Nature Cast with the British Ecological Society. Today we are going to be looking at so many different ways that you and your families and with your friends can get involved with ecology in your local area. My name is Christina Sinclair. I am a marine biologist, a wildlife presenter and an outdoor tutor um, and I have a massive passion for ecology, for nature um, and for wildlife. So my obsession with wildlife and with nature pretty much started at a very, very young age. The real clincher was when I was about eight years old um, and I first saw the original Blue Planet with David Attenborough. And that's where my passion for wildlife and particularly marine uh, wildlife really, really took off. And from then on, there was no going back. There was no return. So as I got older, you know, that fascination with wildlife kind of expanded into not only being fascinated by individual species, um, but also actually about how connected these species were, how everything impacted everything else and how these species interacted with their environment as well and changed it and shaped it. And that's really where I sort of really started thinking about ecology and how fascinating everything is and how connected everything is. So now what I do is I am really passionate about sharing my love and my knowledge um, for ecology and for marine biology and wildlife. So I present my own wildlife documentaries and films and um, with the BBC and for my YouTube um, and also in my daytime role and um, my job as a tutor with the Field Studies Council and I'm based up in the lovely Scotland which for thankfully today um, is looking pretty lovely. Now my main passion is still marine biology and the marine species that we find particularly in the UK um, however I have expanded my love as well um, and I'm really interested uh, in all nature um, but marine is still so today what we're going to be looking to get out of this session, out of this lovely hour that we've got today, we're going to be looking at really easy, really simple, really fun ways that you, your family and your friends can get directly involved with ecology in your local area. So we're going to be looking at some fun activities, ideas and sessions that you can do. 
Now, not only are these sessions, you know, really good fun and really interesting, they also actually contribute towards science and contribute towards the overall health of the planet. So they're fantastic things to do to look after the environment as well as have a bit of fun and learn something new. So how I would like, what I would like to get out of today, what I would like for you guys to do is I would love you to try out the sessions for yourself. Try them out, share what you've done, share them with your friends, encourage your other friends and families to get involved. Um, and we'd love it as well if you could share your findings, share your activities with us on social media, you know, let us know how you've been getting on. So what we're, how the session's gonna work is we're gonna be talking about three different environments that we get here in the UK that you can potentially go and visit and do these activities at. So we're gonna be talking about them and then we're also going to be looking at some pre-recorded videos in each of these environments and look at again some of the activities and some of the wildlife and some of the signs that you can look for for wildlife in those habitats. So it's gonna be great. We're gonna be looking at the coast, my favorite. We're gonna be looking at parks and gardens and we're also going to be looking at urban environments as well. So all environments, everyone can find in the UK, everyone can get access to, and where there is some incredible ecology and incredible wildlife to be found. And of course, I'm a marine biologist, I can't help myself, we're gonna look at the coasts first, okay? So why are coasts so important? Why, why are they important for ecology? Why are they important for the environment? I mean, we could be here for a while. I'll not drag on too much, but the coasts are so, so important for biodiversity, for ecosystem services, and of course, for our own mental health and our well-being. We are really lucky in the UK that we have miles and miles and miles of coastline right at our fingertips. Ordnance Survey uh, estimates that the UK coast is 11,072 miles long mind-blowing it's huge it's absolutely huge and the best part is when you're in the UK you are never more than 70 miles away from the coast now 70 miles is still you know a, a decent way to go but in the grand scheme of things you know that's not too far away hop on a bus hop on a train you can always find the coast nearby and what's always fascinated me about the coast and what still fascinates me today is just the incredible biodiversity that we have on our coastlines. You know, when you think of marine life and, and, and species and diversity, maybe the UK isn't initially your first area that you tend to think of. You might think of the Great Barrier Reef or the Caribbean or the Galapagos, you know, these big far off places. But actually, the biodiversity that we have here in the UK in the marine environment is absolutely incredible and it rivals the Great Barrier Reef and the Caribbean as well and it's fantastic to go and explore. Now what got me interested in the coast in the first place it's really quite tricky to put my finger on it to be honest and I'm sure lots of you that are watching have got a real natural interest in the outdoors and in nature and sometimes you find there's just an area or a species or an environment it just kind of gets you you know it just kind of hooks you in and you almost feel like you've got this kind of natural affinity for it well that's how I've always felt about the coast I was that child when we were walking along the beach that would come back with buckets of shells and my parents would be complaining about what that smell in the back of my room was you know there's just something that always has absolutely fascinated me about it and the otherworldliness of the animals and the species that we see in the water and along our coastline so as well as that, they are, what also interests me is how, how diverse these species are and how incredible their adaptations are. Because the species that we see around our coastline have got to adapt to cope with so many different factors than we on land have to cope with. You know, they have to cope with the water and they have to cope with waves and they have to cope with, you know, a completely 3D environment. It's just not something we have. You know, they can go up, they can go down, they can go left, they can go right. You know, there's so many things that they have got to cope with that we just don't have to. Um, and that has led to some incredible adaptations, weird and wonderful uh, and all sorts of different things. So that's always what keeps me coming back to the coast and why I think everybody should appreciate um, the UK coastline. So for our first video, we are going to take a little trip to the beautiful Welsh coast where Charlotte, Megan and Molly are going to show us what they've found on their coastline and some activities you can do to explore the coast in your area. So we'll go to Charlotte, Megan and Molly just now and we hope you enjoy.
Okay, so I think, are we ready to go to our post video here? So we're going to see... Like just, and we're here today in North Wales, on Anglesey, on Newbra Beach, or in Welsh, Trith Flandwin. It's backed by Newbra Warren, which was designated the first coastal national nature reserve in 1955. And take a look at the view behind me over to Snowdonia National Park. I'm joined today by two young people from our youth-led project, Stand for Nature Wales, and they are part of the Morn Weird Forum. I'm Rally. And I'm Megan. In this session, we're going to be looking at what we can find on our coastline, how to conserve it, and then a fun crafts activity at the end. But first, let's find out a little bit more about Charlotte. <laughs> what inspires you about ecology? My favourite thing about ecology is that there's always something new and interesting to learn. How do you have a positive impact on the natural world? My job, which is to connect people to nature and inspire positive action to care for our planet. What is your favourite ecology fact? Everything in nature is connected. Like John Muir said, when you tug at a single thing in nature, you find it attached to the rest of the world. One example of interconnectedness is what lives in our seas and what washes up on our beaches. And you can see behind me here, this strand line of seaweed that has been brought in by the sea at a high tide and deposited on the beach. But it's not just seaweed. There's all sorts of interesting things that we can find here as well. And this can tell us a story about what lives out in the sea. Let's take a close look at some of the things we can find on the strand line. We found common whelk eggs. These are spongy white masses and each little sack is one egg. Common whelk is one of the largest snails found in UK waters. They are carnivorous and will feed on worms and other mollusks like limpets and mussels. We also found a few carapaces of different crab species. This one is of the spider crab, which is the biggest crab species in the UK. This one is a common green shore crab and this one is an edible crab. This is also a claw from the spider crab. We also found cuttlefish bones. These have hollow spaces which allow them to float and they also represent a healthy breeding population as they breed once and then they die. So this is an egg case which can be a shark, sky or ray. It's also known as a mermaid purse. So once the animal is ready to hatch, it will leave the egg case and this will be left on the strand line. Citizen science is really important as it allows everyday people to engage in science. So one of the citizen science services you can do is an egg case hunt and it was created in 2003 to monitor the shark, skates and rays population and to indicate species presence and diversity. It can be done all year round and you can record your finds on the app. They were some amazing strandline finds, thank you girls. Um, here we've got a uh, a little collection of some of the other things we found on the strand line today. Have a little look and see if you can find them on the spotter sheet. If you look closer in this shell, you'll notice that there's something there that's not natural, that's man-made.
Nurdles are in fact tiny plastic pellets. They're non-natural and they enter the oceans every year and they are dangerous to wildlife. They enter the food chain and are ingested by animals and which can cause them to die. Those nurdles, we found quite a bit of fishing line and fishing net material. These can become entangled in marine animals like turtles, which can ingest them, and because they are made of plastic, they don't decompose, which is extremely dangerous. Birds often take these to their nests as well, which can cause them to become tangled in their nests. One thing that we can do that's really easy to make a difference is litter pick. on to the conservation craft. A really easy one to do, even if you don't live near the sea, are pebble animals. All you need is some glue, some pebbles, uh, a dark pen, or some shells for eyes, and you'll be able to make seals and otters. Thanks for joining us at the beach today. That's all from us here. We're off for a swim. All right, thank you so much to Charlotte, Megan and Molly for that. That was absolutely fantastic. I don't know if they ever actually did go for a swim. I imagine it would be pretty chilly, but that was absolutely fabulous. So after some technical problems, I think I am joined by my lovely, the fabulous Dawood. Dawood, can you hear me okay? I can, yes. And sorry everyone for that um, brief blip. I did go outside to find my um, outside area, but it seems they're doing building work on it, which isn't very useful. So yeah, but I'm here now. Fantastic. Oh, it's so good you've been able to join us there. Fantastic. So um, thank you again to so Charlotte, Megan and Molly so much for that. Um, now, one thing that I think is, or both of us actually think, is really, really important, you know, learning and developing your knowledge um, of a particular environment, you know, how to identify species and the biology of that area, how everything connects together, is really valuable and it's fascinating to learn. But what's also really, really important, we think, in terms of the study of ecology and the appreciation of the environment, is to build up a personal connection with nature, you know, and an emotional connection. So to find ways that you can really, you know, areas or species that you connect with personally to give you that better appreciation for that environment. So we saw lots of objects there um, that Charlotte, Megan and Molly collected from the beach. We saw mermaid purses. I particularly loved those little um, stone animals. The walrus is absolutely incredible. Um, but we, me and the wood, we, when we go out in our environments, we find lots of little things when we're out looking and we collect them. Um, and I certainly, my the flat at home is just covered in little bits. And we want to share with you some of the, the our nature finds. Um, and I'll go first. So we've got this one here. For me, it doesn't look like much, but this little object for me tells a really, really important story. Now, some of you might already know what it is. This is the shell of a native oyster species. Okay. Now, oysters are maybe not something that inspires a lot of wow, that's a really cool species, you know, maybe people more just think about a little slimy thing um, that you eat in posh restaurants. Well, actually, oysters are an incredibly important species across the world. They are filter feeders, and we'll talk a little bit in a minute about what that means. Now, the native oyster, this species here, you can identify it because it's a bit more round and a bit more fat um, than the typical species that you would have maybe in restaurants, which is a bit more long and thin, that specific oyster. And this species used to be really, really abundant across the UK. But since the 19th century, this species has collapsed. We have seen 95% population declines across the UK, which is absolutely awful. And the reason, as I said, that these are so important is that they are filter feeders. So what they do is they soak in water and they pick up particles of food. And that's how they feed. 
But alongside picking up these particles of food, they also pick up other organic matter in the water. So they are natural water cleaners. So they're massively useful for us. And they quite often like to live in brackish water in that area where kind of a, a river meets the sea at the mouth. So often areas that have uh, lots of stuff in it that would be quite like to keep clean. So they're massively useful for us but also they're massively important for other biodiversity as well. So these all gather together in, in reef structures, essentially, in the same way as you might have a coral reef. They build on top of each other and they layer and they layer, and that provides a really good substrate for other animals to live on um, and for nurseries, for fish and various other invertebrates. So not only are they useful for us, they're useful for the wider ecosystem as well. And thankfully, as I said, there were, you know, serious, serious declines in these populations. But scientists, thankfully, were aware of this and they realised that this was happening. They realised they were being overfished and that pollution was causing big issues for them to survive. So what's happening now is that there are many, many reintroduction programmes across the UK where native oysters are being added back to the ecosystem and they are beginning to thrive. And the reason that this, I'm so pleased to find this, is that they are actually being reintroduced into the area where I live. Um, and I found this washed up on the beach right by my house. And it's just, uh, for me, it's just a really nice symbol, a really nice story of hope for ecology and how reintroduction programmes can be successful. So that's my little nature story. DeWood, how about you? What have you got to show for us? So um, I just want to say that oysters are absolutely beautiful. My God, there's so many of them around the beaches over here. Now, I actually, so I have a sort of a plethora of different organisms and leftover bits and pieces from the beach that I sort of pick up when I'm out and about and, and annoy my housemates with. And they're sort of scattered around the room. I did cheat a bit. So I, I have this, which it could blow yours out of the water, but we'll, we'll see. We'll see what. So I've got this, which is a, um, I don't know if everyone can see but um, it's an Australian freshwater crocodile skull. Now, um, so this comes all the way from Australia, actually. And you may have seen their um, older cousin on uh, various Steve Owen productions, uh, the saltwater crocodile. So this is a really beautiful animal, actually. So I don't know if everyone um, can get a good look at that. It is a really astounding um, skull here the detail on that is absolutely extraordinary um so the fr the australian freshwater crocodile which is um also known as a johnson's crocodile is a really beautiful crocodile actually so unlike the huge saltwater crocodiles that you get um in all the mainstream sort of documentaries and shows um so these tiny little guys are not man eaters um fortunately um it doesn't really matter for me since i've only got a head and it's also dead but um they do bite in self-defense so obviously a lot of the people out in Australia will have um, uh, lots of injuries from approaching what seems to be quite a helpless small crocodile, but it has a very powerful draw strength. So I think um, obviously, as you can see by this skull, it isn't very big. Um, the males go to about two, two to three meters long and the females will reach a maximum of about two meters long. Um, so the mm. snout is quite slender. Um, so they will use that to sort of root around for fish um, and other little organisms. And also, if I can show everyone over here, the so the teeth are really extraordinary and they're sort of very, very hook shaped and very sharp. And with a lot of crocodiles, actually, what they will do is they will use these teeth like little hooks and they'll grab in, grab onto prey and they'll grab onto prey items. And the prey can't escape out of the mouth um, this way because they are hooked on by this crocodile's jaw. Now a crocodile actually doesn't have a very um, strong set of muscles to open the jaws with, but it has a very strong set to close them with. So once it's closed down on the prey and hooked in like that, um, the prey just can't escape um, uh, because the crocodile will literally keep it there. And they do this very interesting thing called a death roll. Now a death roll um, is basically, instead of chewing, they grab onto the prey and they will turn over and over and over in the water and sort of rip the prey into shreds and chew it all up. And that means that they don't have to have that chewing action, which they would find hard because they don't have very good jaw strength um, when chewing. And it also means that they don't have to kill the prey and then eat it. They can also, they can do it all in the same um, sort of very ghastly um, manner <laughs> sort of the same action. Um, the unfortunate thing, um, um, about the populations of uh, freshwater salt crocodiles, or 
freshwater uh, Australian crocodiles and mixing them up with their older brother um, is that they are going into decline, unfortunately, um, at the moment. And that's because of a very small organism, which I don't have a fossil of, but I wish I did, or a skeleton, um, which is the cane toad. And so these invasive cane toads are poisonous and the Australian crocodiles will eat them and die, unfortunately. And because there are so many cane toads, it means that the populations of crocodiles are starting to go into decline. So there needs to be something done about that. And I would, could go on and on about invasive species and, of course, the cane toads. <laughs> I think um, we should move on from that. But very exciting. I did slightly cheat, but I think it was exciting enough. I was going to say, I bring out a shell or you bring out a skull of a crocodile. Well, I'm still going to rip. I'm, I'm glad you put in the disclaimer of uh, propping up the oyster there. I'll, no. I'll let you off with that. <laughs> well, fantastic. That's fascinating to hear. So sadly for both of us, we are both marine biologists and we are going to say goodbye to the coast for just now. But we're going to move on to another incredible environment that I certainly have gained massive appreciation for in the last year and a half. And we're going to be looking at parks and gardens. I'm actually in a local park right now and as you can see behind me it's absolutely beautiful. Uh, parks and gardens are an incredibly important again uh, environment for the ecosystem health um, and for again personal connection as well with nature and building up that personal connection because you know as most people have access to a park in their area and um, they're they're the easiest area really for uh someone to get to and someone to connect with the environment connect with the environment there um, and connect with the species and because the, the parks and gardens are often a green area maybe in uh surrounded by an area that's not very green you actually will have loads and loads of species gathering in that area because it's the green area and um, you know the closest green area for miles around um, you know it's massively beneficial for them to go and find that area and it means that for us as ecologists we can go and investigate um, the species that we find there. So I don't know about you Dawood, how are you interested uh, in parks and gardens? So I actually, I think that's where my nature sort of love sort of started. So I'm not, I'm not in a garden right now, unfortunately, but I was set to be outside um, due to human nature. I have been limited um, in that sector. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I started off with my love for nature in gardens because um, actually, I, and in other people's gardens, <laughs> Um, I grew up in a very sort of urbanized area with no garden myself. Um, so I'd go to other people's gardens and parks and areas of nature. And that's where I'd find very small sort of insects and plants and the smaller organisms that interacted really got me interested in nature. And you sort of see that, I think, in parks a lot of the time, especially in English parks, is you see a lot of the time the smaller wildlife is interacting and it's really starting off as a baseline for the rest of the ecosystem, which means that obviously the larger animals can thrive. But I think parks are incredibly important, especially to um, our environments and our ecosystems, since we don't have very large areas of wildlife and megafauna around the UK. We rely, I think, on gardens and parks for those, um, those ecological balances to be achieved. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. So we're going to now go to our next pre-recorded video where we're going to hear from Lauren. Lauren is going to show us um, some incredible features that you can add to your garden um, to encourage wildlife to settle there. And she's also going to show you some incredible activities and sessions that you can do to get involved with citizen science um, and to record some of the pollinators that you might find in your garden. OK, so we'll cut to the video now with Lauren. We hope you enjoy. I'm Lauren Kennedy and I am a lover of nature and being outdoors and I spend most of my time sharing that passion for wildlife with others. The need to be outdoors has driven my career choices. Having studied biology at degree level and then conservation biology as a master's, I have found that I am extremely passionate about plants and the insects that visit them. And I have used that throughout my career both in ecological serving in the UK and further afield through a traineeship with Natural England and then most recently moving into engagement, engaging people in nature through the Field Studies Council and most recently Bumblebee Conservation Trust. I'm now back with the Field Studies Council working on a whole suite of really exciting courses in natural history and environmental art 
sharing my passion for wildlife and being outside with as many people as I possibly can. Being outside is important for me both personally and professionally. I am most calm when I'm walking through woodland or spotting bees on wildflowers or even just pottering in the garden. And I love sharing that passion with others in the hope of inspiring people to stop and take a closer look at the wildlife that's all around us. The UK is such a diverse place for plants and insects. Did you know that we have 24 different species of bumblebee and over 250 species of solitary bees? Our pollinators are so important and it's really, really good to take a look out for them and to provide space for them in your gardens and in local green spaces. Gardens are a great place for wildlife as well as humans. It's estimated that around 87% of households in the UK have a garden, which is around 23 million gardens. That is a huge amount of space and it doesn't even include green spaces in the community as well as community gardens. There are loads of really simple things that you can do for wildlife in your space, no matter the size. You can invite wildlife into your garden by providing food and shelter. No matter the size of your garden, it's super easy to grow plants for pollinators and wildlife. Plants like mint, lemon balm, borage, are all really good plants to have in the garden, not just for yourself and for your family, for food and drinks, but the bumblebees, butterflies and other pollinators love the flowers. They're super easy to grow, just needs a little bit of peat-free compost and a sprinkling of seeds. Keep them uh, watered and watch them grow. Pots are a great way to grow lots of different plants in your garden and to make the most of a paved or patio space. At the end of April, I sowed seed balls in this pot. You can buy these in any garden centre or make them yourself. All you need is a pot, some peat-free compost, you place the seed balls on top and give them a good water and as you can see we already have some seedlings germinating. In our little garden, to make the best use of space, these material raised beds are a brilliant way of growing salads and veggies. These are perfect space savers if you don't have the space to construct raised beds and they're portable, so perfect for rental properties. We leave some of our veggies to flower so that they self-seed. Also the flowers provide pollen and nectar for pollinators. Having a wilder lawn can help support lots of insect species. It might be to everybody's taste, but insects really benefit from sheltering and nesting in long grass. So if you have a, a larger garden, you might be able to leave a corner or a section uncut for insects. And this corner at the moment may seem a little messy. As earlier in the spring, we removed the grass and we've sown this patch with wildflowers in the hope of creating a mini meadow. 
this can take a lot of work as you can see we already have lots of seedlings popping up You don't need to be an expert to get involved in wildlife recording. You can record your wild finds from your garden and your local community through really simple citizen science surveys. These are a brilliant way to help us understand wildlife better, where it is and what it needs. A great example of this is the pollinator monitoring scheme and their fit counts, which are flower insect timed counts. These are really simple surveys and all you need is a little bit of equipment and 15 minutes on a sunny day. They can be done in your garden or local green space. And today you're gonna to join me on my fit count. So for our fit count survey today, I've left the garden in search of one of the target plant species that we need to complete the survey. The list of species is full of really common plants that you can find in your garden and if so then you can complete the survey there. Or as I've done, I've come to my local field as there is a glorious patch of buttercups. This survey has been created by the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. Um, on their website, you can find the full details of how to complete the survey, as well as lots of ID resources. You can also download the app where you can submit your data. So what will we need to complete our survey today? We will need a recording form. Or alternatively, you can fill it in directly on the app. The recording form gives you all the details that you need in how to complete your survey. You'll need a phone for taking pictures and to use as a timer of course our target plant as well as a quadrat which is 50 by 50 centimeters and I've made mine out of cardboard. So to begin your survey, we need to place our quadrat down so that it's full of our target plant species. So you can see all my buttercups in my quadrat. You need to count the flower heads. How many buttercups do you have in there? And then you can start your survey. So the survey is timed at 10 minutes. You want to make sure that you're sitting at the right distance. You can see it really easily but you aren't leaning over the quadrat and then we're just taking a very simple tally of the pollinator groups that you see these are bumblebees honeybees solitary bees wasps hoverflies other flies butterflies and moths and beetles and then there's two boxes for small insects that we can't identify and other insects so you really do not need to know everything to species level as we're just tallying these broad groups. So you're taking a tally every time um, one of those insects lands on a flower. So if they're underneath on the leaves or hiding in the grass, then we don't tally those.
By creating space for wildlife, you're also creating opportunities to get a closer look at the brilliant wildlife the UK has to offer. Whether you're contributing to data collection through fit counts, or whether you're just sitting back and watching the bees do their thing, I would encourage you all to stop and take a look at the incredible diversity of wildlife all around you. All right, that was amazing. Thank you so much, Lauren. Now, hopefully you can see here uh, me what we've got in front of us today. Me and DeWood are going to have a little challenge. Now, one of the activities that Lauren recommended for encouraging pollinators to grow, uh, encouraging pollinators to come to your garden is by planting wildflowers and by planting seed bombs. So we are about to have a little competition. I would roll my sleeves up if I could. I'm quite competitive. Now we're going to be seeing who can make five seed balls in as quick a time as possible. Now to make your seed balls, you do not need a lot of equipment. All you need is some peat-free compost. You need your wildflower seeds and you need some powdered clay. Okay. I've also got some water with me to help it bind together. Okay. So we're going to be seeing who can make five perfect seed balls quick, uh, in the quickest time. Dawood, how are you feeling about it? You got some fight and talk for me? I don't think I have any, actually. I'm woefully um, not as competitive as anyone I know, so this will be terrible. <laughs> I'll probably make one and then give up. Um, no, but I'm, I'm ready with way too much soil. We'll see how we go. Well, I've got, I've, I've got different amounts, so I'm not too sure of exactly the, the recipe <laughs> that I'm going to go for, uh, but we'll see how we get on. So, I think I'm all good to go. Shall mm -hmm. we do a little countdown from five? All right, let's That's go for go. it. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. All right, I've got my seeds. Got my compost. Oh, oh. Got my clay. Gonna go for a sprinkle of water. Sort of adding things very, very fast and in a very chaotic fashion. Oh, I've dropped some on the floor. Never mind. <laughs> I haven't considered later. how I'm going to, I haven't really thought about how I'm going to wash my hands after this, but we can, yes, all good. Yep. we can work out. We, Mine's not coming together. Yeah. I did think about that for a second. I need more water. Come on. Come on, seed balls. Oh no, it's going all over the place. Yeah, no, it's A bit more water. As long as you can mix everything up. <laughs> am I still, am I winning though? As long as I'm winning, that's fine. I mean, I barely made one, so. Well, I, mine is just resembles sort of brownie mixture right now. I don't know if you can see that. My hand is looking rather interesting. Okay, I'm going to see if I can make a ball out of this. Mine resembles... No, that's, that's no, that, a, that's a, that, that counts. That's a ball, first ball. Here we go. That's, that's that one ball. Front. I've got one. Okay, right. I need to get that's that up. Right, I'm on to number two. Number two, seed ball. Oh, my God. Oh, oh both hands muddy now. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Now, ball number three. I love these because you can just throw them into the garden and then wait for them to grow. As long they as it's in a bare perfect. soil, obviously. And you can do them any time of year, can't you? Exactly, yes, that's amazing. Very easy to make and very useful. Ah, see, I distracted you with my, with my chat. I have completed. They're maybe not perfect spheres, I suppose. But here we have five seed balls ready to go. You have Where five you seed balls? Oh my God. Yeah, look at them. Here we go. I'll see if That's I can fit crazy. them all in my hand. I've got two. <laughs> As I said, they're, they're, they're not perfect balls, maybe, and I'm not sure of the ratios of... I'm not too sure how much seed actually ended up in there, but here we have five lovely seed balls. Simple as that. God, I love the smell of soil, but I have only two, so I'm obviously a loss. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Do I get do I get dunked in something? Does something get thrown at me? Um... That's okay. I'll maybe come and give you a high five at some point when I... <laughs> oh, you've let me off. I'm never going to learn now. That's true, I suppose. Next time, we'll, we'll improve your technique. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> but as you can yeah. see, dead simple, dead easy, dead quick, and you can make it a little bit competitive if you want. A really easy way to encourage pollinators to come to your garden, make some seed balls, chuck them in the garden, 
and let them grow in their own time. The clay kind of protects them, keeps the moisture in until such a time that they're ready to grow. So I think we will get on to our next environment, which is our mm. final environment, and we'll look at our urban environment. So this is where, DeWood, you've prepared a little something for us, haven't you? I did. I was going to say, we have a video from a very, very amazing and very knowledgeable person, but it is just me, so maybe not, but we'll see. <laughs> After that um, seed challenge, I don't have high um, confidence in myself, to be honest, but we'll go with it anyway. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be great. So Dawood is going to tell us a little bit about where their personal connection to wildlife and ecology came from. Um, because there's maybe this perception that you can't build an ecological relationship if you live in the middle of a city or in an urban environment. But in actual fact, urban environments in the UK are thriving with wildlife. I've had some incredible experiences with urban wildlife in the last year. And I think they would have as well, as they'll be telling us in a moment. Mm -hmm. So I think when we're ready, um, we can have a little look um, at the Woods video, please. Hi, I'm Darwood Qureshi. I'm a freelance journalist, marine biologist, conservationist, um, wildlife filmmaker and photographer. And I'm here to speak to you about connection with nature. Now, where did my connection for nature begin? So really, um, for me, it started off in a very urban setting. And it started off with looking for small things and really paying attention to the tiny things around me because I grew up without a garden. I grew up not in great proximity to reserves and large areas of green space. Um, I grew up homeschool, so I was taken to areas of nature by my mum, like parks and things, and that really sparked an interest in wildlife, and that really sparked an interest in everything that was going on around me, because I'd see all of these tiny, tiny little insects and organisms and plants interacting with each other, and I just thought to myself, this is absolutely fascinating. You know, this is something that I want to do for the rest of my life. And so that connection with nature was really built from an early age. So you can't see right now, but I will pan the camera around in a minute. But we're in a beautiful, beautiful park in the middle of Portsmouth. And it's really, really, it's gorgeous over here. Um, the lighting is good. There's lots of different species of wildlife and animals around. I've seen lots of starlings flying overhead and there's loads of insect life out today. Um, so connection with nature. So when you're connected to nature, you really have to feel that emotional connection, I think. A lot of people talk about the systematic, the logical, you know, the scientific, the very clinical side of nature and why you should be connected to nature in that way. But I think 90% of science and 90% especially of natural history and the passion that people have for natural history is that passion and it's that emotion. It's that emotional connection that you have to nature. And a lot of people will have this connection when, um, when they're younger when they start off from a very young age, when they're introduced to nature at a very young age, which is why I think it's incredibly important to be connected to nature and to have that natural connection from a young age because it starts you off in the right direction. So that connection with nature is vital, I think, especially for our everyday lives. So for me, um, I grew up in a very urbanized area and that meant that the connection that I had with nature is slightly different to other people because I didn't grow up surrounded by the stereotypical nature that you see on screen, that you see in documentaries, that you see in mass media um, produced, like I said, documentaries. Um, so I had to find that connection for myself. Um, and I really had to go out and find it in the nooks and crannies of urban areas, like the small speed wheel growing up the side of walls, or the tiny little insects in the size of windowsills. You know, I used to look for wood lice, I used to look for worms, and my first loves actually were plant life and insect life, because they were the easiest to find. And it's really fascinating when I think about that my connection with nature really came from those small areas, and it gave me a better value for the natural world because I couldn't always see it, it wasn't always accessible. So I think in terms of natural connection and in terms of how we feel connected to nature, these things start off from a young age and they start off when you are immersed in nature, whether that be yourself, like me, whether that be you know yourself choosing to be immersed in nature, or whether that be a parent or a teacher immersing you with nature. Having said that, it's never too late 
to have that connection with nature because it's around us all the time. And I think oftentimes people forget how connected we all are to nature all the time. There is no one in the world that isn't connected to nature. Why am I talking about this connection to nature all of a sudden? For me, it's happened because over time, as I've seen lots of different people, and myself included, drift away from nature. And that's what's bothered me. Because I've seen that even though we are all connected to nature, indirectly or directly, you know, whether or not we know, we are all affected by whatever happens to nature. And whatever happens to nature will affect us. Our lives are so intertwined that we can no longer be without nature. And so for me, what I really sort of understood is the fact that some of us are becoming disconnected to nature, especially in urban areas. And why is that? For me, especially in urban areas, it is because of the documentaries, of the mass media produced films that always focus on areas that aren't close to us. And so we don't understand that we are all connected, whether or not we know it. You know, even around here where it might be a, quite an urbanised area or even in where I grew up in a very urbanised city, I always had nature around me. There was always nature wherever you looked because nature lives everywhere. But we've been led to believe that nature only exists in very stereotypical nature um, areas. So what I'm trying to do with this is to really make people understand that nature is all around us all the time. And I hope that in, in this festival, in this conference, what can really happen is people can see that nature is around them all the time and they can be connected to it, whoever they are, wherever they are, whatever knowledge they have. Amazing. Thank you so much for that, Dawood. So I think we're going to go now to a video, Dawood, that you made um, in your local park and we're going to have a little look at what wildlife you saw there. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was, it was absolutely beautiful being in that environment. And so here's just some of the, some of the nature that I saw um, in that environment. It's quite a it's quite a sort of urbanized area as you can see, but even in those areas you can still find pockets of nature and wildlife. So yeah, um, oh yeah, go go to you. Oh, it's it's just absolutely beautiful. I mean, it's I really gained an appreciation for sort of urban wildlife just in the last year because I think I was quite guilty before, you know, the pandemic that I would always try and find somewhere wild. I would always try and leave. An urban area to find wildlife but then you know people were forced to stay in urban environments over the last year and actually when I started looking I, I saw so much peregrine falcons and kingfishers and foxes it's amazing it really is it's astounding especially if you go into these urban areas and you um you find those little pockets of nature so I go out into the gardens a lot of the time and I find lots of different species of bees and I was really excited mm. about that video um that we saw on bees and bumblebees and the bumblebee conservation trust because I usually find at least five or six different species of bees in one very small area of garden, like in that environment right there that we saw, um, you know, I found at least two species of butterflies, five species of bees, three species of beetles, you know, and loads of different species of wildflowers. So it just comes to show that you go out into nature and you look around and you can find anything right in front of you, you just have to look very closely. Absolutely, absolutely. And we're actually, we're now going to look at a wave um, from one of our contributors, Janine, is going to show us some creative and interesting ways that you can explore um, an urban environment. Especially in urban areas, it can be difficult to spot nature. Too often we focus on getting to our destinations and not what we see along the way, or the hidden ecology. Urban wandering is a technique that can help us to explore a familiar place, but in an unfamiliar way. It encourages exploration without bias. One way of carrying out urban wandering is to use cards like these to help you explore. In this case, I start my urban wandering by following a smell. I then spend time looking up and around me before tossing a coin to decide on my next direction. Heads I go left, tails I go right. Then I follow a bird, find a reflection, and so on. It is important to remember to keep safe at all points and not to get too lost along the way. It can be really fun to create your own set of urban wandering cards. 
What might you put on them to help you explore your local area? One way of encouraging nature connections is by noticing good things in nature. A recent study in 2016 found that noticing just three good things in nature each day for a week led to longer term increases in nature connection. We're going to show you a little video clip that Darude took at their local beach and we would like you to watch it and try to recognise three good things in nature from that video clip. You might even try keeping your own three good things in nature diary. Have a go, see if you can keep it up for a week. Fantastic, thank you so much for that Janine. Um, absolutely, that facilitating that emotional connection is so so important. Now we're sadly almost out of time and um, but we're going to go first um, to, or finally to our Q&A session. So we've had a couple of questions. I'm going to ask you Dawood first. There's a really lovely question that's come in actually. So quite often I find it's quite easy to get bogged down by you know the problems that we're facing in our environments and kind of challenges that we're up against in preserving environments. But this question has come in is can you tell us about uh, an ecological success story um, that you are really sort of uh, connected to or, or really find very fascinating? Yes, definitely. So there's one that I'm particularly connected to. So I um, uh, grew up in London, obviously, but moved to an area called High Wycombe, and that's sort of near to Oxfordshire. And there's a species here, a species of bird, actually, that flies over all the time. And there's there's bunches and bunches of these birds and you see them all the time. They land on fields, on houses, and that's the red kite. So the red kite is an absolutely beautiful, oh, it's an absolutely beautiful bird. I find the feathers sometimes, if I'm lucky, I can get, that's how close I can get to it. But a really beautiful bird of prey, um, quite a large wingspan actually compared to some of the other birds of prey that we have that um, exist regularly in England. Um, but the red kite success story is something that I think is quoted quite a lot as a conservation success story. So they were, um, they were were reasonably um, regular in their existence in the UK um, uh, quite a while ago but they became the target of bounty hunters and egg hunters who would steal the eggs and hunt the birds and so the population declined um, quite a lot so it went to um, double figures actually and you had less than 20 individuals at one point in the UK and it was very it was a drastic decline um, but what they did was they got um, birds from other countries and they brought them back to the UK and they they allowed the population to rise significantly and now they are in their thousands around the UK and it is extraordinary to look up and you hear the sort of the keeling cry of a, of a red kite as it flies over um, the house and it's one of the most um, it's one of the most regular calls actually you hear in High Wycombe um, in an area where it where you know at one point there wasn't anything so it's extraordinary to see that rise in the population and I think for me that is a conservation success story that I'm connected to because I see it um, or I used to see it at least when I live there every single day when I look up. That sounds absolutely fabulous. Mm -hmm. We see red kites in certain sections around Scotland. And the first time I saw one, oh, my heart, they were just beautiful, aren't they? That's fantastic. They are. They're beautiful. When you look at those eyes, golden eyes, red um, sort of plumage, amazing. Um, yeah, so uh, I think that there's another question that's coming, which uh, I think is quite an interesting question, really. So it's uh, I think it will help people a lot who are listening to this. So um, as a parent, um, how can I support, encourage, you know, and nurture my child's interest in ecology? That's a really, really good question. And I think a really important one as well, you know, for the both of us and for so many people that I know in ecology, their, their love for the environment started at a really young age. And it is so important to nurture that from a young age. Um, I think it's one of these things you don't have to get, maybe for people, for parents who aren't biologists or aren't ecologists or maybe haven't had that interest for themselves, it probably can feel quite daunting. Well, I, I'm not an expert. I don't know what these species are. How, how can I encourage it? But you absolutely don't have to be an expert. What I really enjoy in my teaching role as an outdoor tutor is if a student asks me something, 
I, I don't want to give them the answer. I want them to learn for themselves. And you can do exactly the same thing as a parent. OK, maybe your kid asks you, oh, what's the species of bumblebee? I don't know. Let's find out together. And then it's a journey that you're kind of taking together. So I would just encourage that curiosity as much as possible. And, and you don't have to be an expert. You know, there's plenty of useful uh, information online and incredible free resources from various um, conservation charities and wildlife charities where you can go and learn if you want and courses that you can do. You know, that's, that's absolutely fine. I think it's all just about getting them to physically be in nature and teaching them how to look. I think quite often you, you wander around a green space and you're maybe not really looking. You're aware of what you're passing, but you just need to kind of take a moment to stop and look. So by really for parents, just getting your, your young people out there regularly and encouraging them to, to explore their local area, I think is just the most important thing. And there are some fantastic clubs for young people as well. I myself was a, an RSPB wildlife explorer um, when I was a child and I absolutely loved that. So there are clubs and, and places that you can meet more people um, that will you know, keep you um, and kind of encourage that connection as well. But really, I think it's just it's fundamental. It's just getting them out there and getting them um, appreciating what they see. I would, yeah, I definitely agree. That's one of the most amazing things I think as a kid is to get connected with nature physically, you know, to go outside and to see it and smell it and taste it, I guess, but probably not that so much. But, you know, you can do that sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, check check any foraging guys. We do not advocate um, chasing uh, random things. <laughs> Make sure you know what you're looking for. <laughs> I think, sadly, that's probably all we've got time for just now. Um, we really, really, really hope that you have enjoyed this session, that you've got something out of it. Please do um, try these activities out, share what you're doing with us, share them with your friends, and just encourage that involvement with ecology, that involvement with the outdoors. So, would you have any words to say? I do. I'd just like to say sorry again for being late, but it's been an extraordinary um, sort of run and I really have enjoyed communicating my love of nature. I know um, Christina has as well. And it's just been absolutely amazing. Yes. And I hope that everyone takes away from this a real sort of love for nature and a respect for going outside and getting physically connected with it, because I think, you know, that can never be underestimated, in my opinion. But yeah, I think that that is all from us, unfortunately. And I hope to see everyone else on another live stream or another program that we do at one point in our lives. Absolutely, absolutely. And you can check out what we're up to um, on our social media as we're both on Instagram, Twitter um, and YouTube. And you can check us out there. I think from us today, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. It's been brilliant. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And yeah, I hope you have the good rest of your day, good rest of the of the week. Thank you.